Welcome to VUC 2019, Visions Under Construction. That's right, I have to remind myself that the intro is extremely short now. And uh, we've got a couple of things to do before we talk to Evan, who's a co-founder and CTO of SignalWire. But before that, I want to remind you of a few things. Hey, maybe there's a SigWilecom coming. That's in, the, that's in the roadmap. But first of all, I think the first one in order chronologically would be Kamaya World. A lot of us. You guys, co Are you guys going, uh, Evan? Yes. Yes, we will be there. Somebody's going to be there, right? Mm -hmm. You bet. Okay, great. Uh, Kamaya World, we're going to be there. Lots of the VUC people and... A lot of usual suspects that you know, and these are these are events that are really fantastic. Now I don't know what order this is in. That looks that doesn't look right. Let's go to ComCon. All right, that's in the UK, and there's the information there. It's seventh to eleventh of July, twenty twenty nine. Of course, who's got the parakeet going on there? That's ClueCon. Evan, you know something about that too? Just a little bit. So uh, ClueCon's happening August 5th to 8th in Chicago. And I was looking, got, just got an email about this. It's IIT Real-Time Communications. I don't know a lot about the relation between that and TADHAC, but there it is. It's in October, and there is a thing in Chicago. And that's a pretty serious, pretty serious thing, too. If you want to join us on Mastodon, masto.vuc.me. I don't know how long we'll keep that going if nobody shows up. It's like one of those parties where, hey, you know, too crowded because nobody goes or whatever that joke is. Anyway, back over to the camera. I'm going to introduce Evan, who um, we've known for probably nine of the 12 years we've been doing this. Evan, what, where did you get started in all this? I got started, you know, in this industry by really just doing um, the standard VoIP consulting route, right? Like I downloaded Astros can free switch to my home computer and started installing things and hooked up VoIP trunks and just kind of took it from there. It's a very classic route, right? The cl I think a route that a lot of people got into it. Um, some people got into it straight from the coding side of it. I got into it more from the consulting side of actually like doing installs and helping people out and getting it working and wiring up um, physical, you know, T1s and things like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing too exciting in that regard. It was all kind of self bootstrapped in that way. Okay, and um, you probably went to what were you? What was your first Astrocon and first uh, Clue? What was your first ClueCon? It's maybe more important, actually. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, ClueCon's been going what twelve? No, how many years uh, ClueCon? Yeah, yeah, I think this is like the twelfth, thirteenth year. Mm -hmm. We've gone, I think it's since two thousand five. I think thirteen years. Yeah, it's um. So I was at ClueCon. Let's th let's think back. Uh, at first, I have to peg it as. Probably the same years that Astrocon in Denver. Um, so I don't know when, when was that? 2012? 20 sounds close. Yeah, 11 ish. I was at, I was there with and Randall uh, Schwartz was there too. Yeah, yeah. The first guy that I, actually one of the first people that I ever talked to at either conference was James Bodie, um, yeah. which was a great introduction to the entire community. So running into him for the for the first person, if if anyone could be a gatekeeper to all of uh, the Void community, yeah, I'm glad it's James. That is funny. I used to see him on Free World Dial-Up. I don't know if you're familiar with that. that oh, yeah, way. of course. All right. Mm -hmm. We talked briefly, and I wanted to evoke or invoke, depending on uh, where you place yourself, uh, a little bit of the history, but very brief. And we were talking about Asterisk was one of the first, actually, Free Will Dial-Up, right, mm -hmm. which was a, kind of almost a ham radio of PSTN. But Free Will Dial-Up did use Asterisk, as far as I know, and maybe, maybe something else. Uh, back in the day, asterisk, then free switch. And these were exciting times where everybody was building their stuff. And ah, money, look at this. Oh, inward dialing, uh, DID. And, you know, now we're talking, we're, we're 15 more or more years later, and a lot of water under the bridge. And that stuff is much less exciting now than it was then. But what is exciting is the ability to do other stuff with calls, the extended things that we can do. And that's not brand new. There's been a whole bunch of, you know, click to call and blah, blah, blah. But the exciting stuff now is that you receive a call and you have the context. As Tim Panton once said a few years ago, context. And he, when he was working for, I think, a Tropo or Voxeo. And at that time, they were also doing some things like this. So you're going to receive a call. You want to start doing something with the call. And I guess a dial 
plan is not going to be sufficient. You're going to need more power. So that's where I would say signal wire comes in. Signal wire is maybe apparently people have said it's completely separate from free switch, but it's actually does come from that community anyway. So let's talk about how this broke out, first of all, and um, what the excitement is about single wire, signal wire. Sure thing. So yeah, you know, FreeSwitch right now is the um, parent company of FreeSwitch Solutions, right? The, we acquired FreeSwitch Solutions, which was uh, Anthony Minasali's company with Brian West and Michael Jarris. Um, and so we're the primary contributors to the FreeSwitch project, right? It's still an open source project. Anyone can, you know, submit code and patches and things like that. But um, SignalWire now employs all the primary uh, code contributors to it. So we're kind of like just like the parent company that's shepherding the development of it along. Um, and one of the reasons we started SignalWire was to give the FreeSwitch project that sort of secure footing. I don't think people have realized historically that uh, guys like Tony and Brian and Mike were all required to work uh, for other companies like Barracuda Networks. Um, for a long time. That set the direction of the project. And people just weren't aware that like the code being written was specifically for what Barracuda needed to be done for their coup de tail project. And then after that, um, for various companies that were funding it. So part of the reason to start this company was also to the source project, that sort of secure footing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that got me really interested in, in SignalWire, and one of the reasons we built it is, you know, my real love of VoIP and why I got into it was actually through Adhesion, that project. And that was like 2008, 2009, because what I loved about that was I was a big, I was getting into Ruby at the time, and I found the dial plan stuff in both Asterix and FreeSwitch to be a little bit too confusing to really like, to mess with in a way that I could, I could grok sort of internally very, very quickly. Um, and I wanted to use other, uh, things in an ecosystem. And it sort of just was a little too, too complicated to get in there and like muck with the C code constantly. And so Adhesion gave me the power of using Ruby and gems and all that ecosystem to then build up actual root applications and do real things. Build, like you said, click to call and all kinds of cool stuff like that. Um, you know, build in-call translation mechanisms because we could easily do HTTP calls and things that just kind of made more sense to a web programmer and kind of apply that mentality to VoIP. Um, and so with SignalWire, right, what we wanted to do was kind of take that same thing. Tony likes to think about it too, and we talk about this a lot, is that uh, you know, when he started Free Switch, it's because getting a giant, massively powered, you know, multi-call um, switch was super expensive in 2005, right? That would have been a couple hundred thousand dollars minimum, if not more. Um, so he took that and really wanted to commoditize that down into commodity hardware. Just then. So he was worried about scalability and throughput and performance. And now we see an inflection point where we can kind of take that, and people now Performance is still important, but they're trying to scale this up to number, like you know, to hitherto unseen numbers. You know, millions of WebRTC endpoints at the same time, perhaps even you know into the hundreds of millions or billions potentially. Um, how do you scale that? And scaling the software is non-trivial, as we think we all know, and everyone who's listening uh, might or might not know. You know, putting it on one machine is pretty easy, but going across many machines is pretty tough. So. Um, we wanted to solve that problem by taking FreeSwitch and making it sort of elastically scalable in the cloud. It's something that anybody can use, anybody can kind of get to, and then really taking it and making it a lot simpler. One of the things that it's always remained, and I think the whole industry remains, is a bit complex to um, newbies and incomers, people who have not been exposed to things like, yeah, SIP trunking and what that means, and A leg, even A leg, B leg stuff. And, you know, it takes a bit of a weird thinking power to understand how it all kind of fits together. So we really want to try to make that as simple as it possibly can be. So people can just show up and say, hey, cool. Um, I want to put communications into my application, and I could just do it. I can do video, I can do audio, I can do chat, I can do whatever I want. And here you go, here's the thing, and it goes, and it just works. Right, right. Um, we, we've talked a lot. I mean, I, I'm actually testing SignalWire now. I am not, uh, I'm a horrible programmer, first of all. So I haven't done any programming on it. I've used, as I told you earlier, I've used other platforms. And you know, what basically uh, people like me, what we do is we find somebody else's fragment, mess with it, personalize it, you know, your domain name here <laughs> kind of thing. So, you know, there's no secret and I don't have any uh, pretension for programming skills, although I love to test stuff and demo it. Uh, but all I've done so far is register a couple of uh, numbers. Your, by the way, your DID rates, DID being a PST and a phone number that people can rent monthly 
are absurdly low. Uh, you, I think are you going to be able to maintain right. rates? They're less than a penny, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. They're uh, well. They're I think they're eight cents a month right eight now. Cents, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that was actually one of our things, too. I meant to say less than a dollar because um, Call Centric used to give free DIDs for years. And right. they, moved, they moved, and I understand why they can't do that. And they moved to one dollar. The point is eight cents a month. I mean, if you only needed, if you need 10, that's 80 cents a month. That's, that's right. If your company, if whatever you're doing can't afford 80 cents a month, Dan Jenkins, <laughs> um, <laughs> he's with us and he's going to talk about uh, the uh, conference in a few minutes. If you can't afford 80 cents a month for 10 lines, I don't know what you're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, and it, it's one of our things too, is we wanted to, you know, we, we looked around the industry right now and we see people still charging a dollar a did. People have been charging a dollar a phone number for uh, 10 years. It's like, it's just, you know, and those prices have dropped precipitously. So we've seen, what we see basically in the industry is just price gouging at this point from entrenched players who effectively rely on those margins to make their bottom line. And it just isn't, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, there is plenty of margin to be made at lower numbers like eight cents, uh, as well as building up ecosystems of other tools that are useful, things you would pay for that add value to your application that aren't just charging for the underlying commodity layer. Because that really is just kind of a race to the bottom, right? And you know, we're hoping to somewhat accelerate that. That's you're totally right. Uh, so what is the uh, what are the receivables? Because the eight cents uh, uh, per per did, as you call them, uh, is not going to keep anything afloat. So what are the plans? How does that all work? What do I have to pay to do amazing things and scale them up? Sure. Well, you know, for now, right now, what we, a lot of the stuff we're doing is free as we continue to build out our API sets so people can kind of experiment with it. Um, we do make money on every phone number and minute and everything like that. So we're not, there is no, we're not, you know, giving these things away um, or trying to be a charity in that regard. Uh, all the numbers do pencil out, and the math is there, and the spreadsheets are there. Um, so it's all very safe and confident and on secure footing. Uh, going forward, we're going to be releasing you know, more and more APIs. Um, right now, you've probably seen that the one thing we've released is an uh, uh, API layer we call LAML. And LAML, uh, which stands for the Legacy Antiquated Markup Language, is a um, syntax-compatible one with existing Twimble markup language. And we did that so people could have like an ease of moving their applications over to SignalWire. Uh, but coming up very shortly, probably within the next few weeks, hopefully, we'll be dropping our Relay APIs. And the Relay ones are a WebSocket-based real-time API that gives you everything from real-time billing information um, to just like call command and control. Very much like if you were sitting at uh, the free switch uh, terminal, you could just like type in commands or do whatever. Or people who are familiar with it hook up like an event socket, or people who, uh, who know Adhesion, like hook up your Adhesion to it. Um, you'll have that level of control. And we'll be taking those APIs and doing everything from, you know, automatic speech recognition all the way through, you know, typical like gather and DTMF scenarios, anything you can possibly imagine. Um, some of those will cost nothing because they're sort of very easy. Some will have an underlying cost basis because they actually do cost us money, right? ASR and things like that aren't free. NLU isn't free. Uh, it's natural language understanding, that kind of thing. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to do things like one of the one of our real goals is, like you said, Randy, is we want to make this for people just like you who don't have a lot of programming chops. And one thing you have to do right now, if you want to do even a label application, is set up a lot of like web hook callbacks. So like you do something, and then a, a request is fired to you. You have to have a web server on your side that gets receives the response and program do that kind of stuff. We want to get rid of all of that. We want to take all your infrastructure and just get rid of it totally. So we just do it all on our side. So it's a totally infrastructure infrastructureless thing for you. And you can kind of build it, and we host that all for you. Um, and naturally, that hosting has some costs associated with it. So that's the model in which we're going. And those are the kind of advanced API sets that we're going to be building um, that you'll see have you know more revenue attached to them in that regard. OK, and that uh, one of the questions I was talking about earlier, actually on the Slack, should we broadcast some of the URLs, by the way? First of all, SignalWire, SignalWire.com. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. And they can probably yep. find their way to wherever they're looking for from that. Um, I believe, by the way, you can open up. Um, you can still open up a free account, right? And get absolutely, a yep. Five dollars. Five dollars of credit. That's right. See, five dollars. Divide eight cents into five dollars. How many numbers could you have for a month in that trial? I don't Oof. know. Somebody else <laughs> help me. Anyway, so 60, point, you have sixty-two. One number for sixty-two months, or sixty-two numbers for a month. There you go. <laughs> so the point is, you wouldn't have any trouble. You go in and look at the whatever the docs that are existing are, and mess around with that interface. Um, one of my questions was international because that's a hard nut to crack. Um, I know I'm very familiar with Voxbone and Voxbone has cracked the nut. 
Uh, but everywhere you see rates, there's not going to be any eight cents a minute, that's for sure. But um, wh where are we going with international? Because I happen to be in another country, and a lot of other people are too. Uh, for example, Dan Jenkins, who's going to speak in a moment. Believe me, <laughs> there. Uh, and also, you guys uh, should probably come to uh, the United you, the disunited kingdom this okay. summer to do that thing. Are you going? Are you have any plans, Evan? You know? Yes, we were. I, I was there last year, and uh, right, right. I know. Would love to return. Excellent. Hint, hint. Uh, international. What? Uh, what do you think? Uh, we've got something in the future for that. Like Absolutely. Numbers in other countries uh, and rates. I my current uh, connection to SignalWire. I assume I haven't tried, but I assume I can't call to foreign numbers yet but correct maybe, maybe that'll is that's going to come at some point maybe that's absolutely right yeah it's actually um very high on the request list in the future people have been wanting um so it'll be here it will be here very shortly international as you know like it does come with a lot of other complications uh you know not only is it just like an internal thing with um billing and formatting of numbers and you know invoicing and that kind of stuff um, but there's regulations in certain countries we have to follow and we want to make sure you know we are fortunately we started the company um being gdpr compliant so we wanted to make sure we maintain all of that um so we're really trying to take all the steps proper to get this out the door in a way that's sustainable and it doesn't have any kind of like you know underlying fraud problems and stuff like that um, but it's going to be, uh, it's been a big, big item for a lot of potentially big clients who wanted to work with the EU and other areas around the world. So in Australia, you know, just, just kind of everywhere. So okay. we've been focusing on North America as we get it all out, but it'll be here shortly. Exactly. Exactly. That's, it's not easy to do that. Um, and anyone who is doing it is not giving it away. It's, it's rather expensive. I mean, even yeah. from here, let's face it, even phone calls from here, as um, the prices have gone down, uh, we there are still countries you can't call for under a dollar a minute. Right. Uh, for, I'm talking about from Europe now, and I'm sure yeah. the United States has the same problem because these countries, you know, there's a stranglehold on on telecom. Well, one nice thing is we know a lot of you know through our adventures and other people who are associated with FreeSwitch uh, and SignalWire, we know a lot of people in a lot of these telecoms, right? So we've reached out, you know internally to a lot of these companies be like hey like let's talk about this everything from rates to interconnects to how this all works so we've been spending a lot of time over the past year and a half just having conversations with these guys figuring out hey you know what are we going to do here how's this going to work what's the best way forward um and so that's been part of it as well is just really trying to navigate the current landscape and figure out like also not just do things the way everyone else has done them right really try to find a new path forward um that may seem on the outside to be identical to everybody else, but really underneath, hopefully, it'll be somewhat new and different. Uh, so yeah, it's been a lot of that kind of conversation. Not not terribly exciting to discuss, but when it gets here, hopefully, you're going to see, you know, the most competitive rates you've seen on international, both phone numbers and uh, inbound outbound, you've seen hopefully in a long time. So we're excited about that too. Well, I think another thing to be excited about in this is watching it develop because once when you're on a platform that's that's all everything's done. It's much harder, I think, it's much harder to talk to people and go, well, you know what, uh, I'd like to see this. Because, hey, you know, most people who are established are going to go, well, you know, we're done, <laughs> basically. I mean, they're yeah. going to keep looking to an extent, but they're not going to be. Let me put this another way. Um, the newer platform is going to be hungrier, so you're going to have to go yes. and prove yourself. No, that's, you know, hey. You're absolutely right. No, we are definitely what hungrier. <laughs> that's what it is. 100%. Hey, let's go for a commercial break with, <laughs> I'm kidding, but Dan, uh, I asked Dan to come and tell us about uh, the news for IPCOM, and he might as well do it now, and that way, if he's busy, he can run off. Dan? Hello. How is everyone? I'm good. good I'm good, sure Dan. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, Randy asked me yesterday to, to send him something about ComCon, and then obviously I didn't because, you know, um, so now you're on the spot. Uh, so so now I'm trying to think off the top of my head what I need to tell you about ComCon. Um, so I guess the first thing to tell you about ComCon is uh, early bird tickets close on the 28th of February. So you've got a week. Um, if you want to save £200 per ticket, which is the best you're going to get money off wise, that's over 10% off. Um, you you want to buy your ticket in the next in the next week, um, 
The, the second thing is the CFP closes on the 28th of February as well. Call for papers. Yes, the call for papers, the call for proposals, whatever you want to call it. Um, that closes on the 28th as well. UK time, I think. So if, <laughs> if you're in the US, you need to get in before the end of the 28th. Um, and and yeah, um, so they're the, they're the two main things um, that you, you, you need to get done before the end of February. Um, and then obviously, all of the information is on the website. Uh, 2019.comcon.xyz or comcon.xyz without HTTPS because there's something broken right now that I will fix at some point in the near future. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's looking to be really really great. We've got loads of sponsors already signed up, which is amazing. Um, I think this time last year I was like scrounging around a lot of people going. Do you want to sponsor? Do you want to sponsor this weird event that that is completely and utterly wacky? And everyone went, hmm. Um, so this year, um, this year we're much further ahead than we were last year, which is amazing. Um, I'd obviously like to be a lot further ahead um, and have sold all of my tickets already, um, but that is not how people do things. Um, the Kamit Elio world. CFP, for example, closed on a Sunday, and and I when when did I, the person that runs an event, put my talk in on the Sunday? Um, so I completely and utterly understand people waiting until the last minute because I do exactly the same thing. Dan, um, could you compare the venues because I was at the last one. Evan was there as well. And, yeah. Um, let's hear about uh, that com compared to last year, which was a huge success. Everybody knows. Yeah, so last year was at Wooten House, um, and that was part of the De Vere um, chain in the UK. Um, this year we're at Latimer Estate, um, and that is part of the same chain. So it's the same quality as last year um, in terms of uh, accommodation, in terms of standards for restaurants, in terms of how they keep all of their grounds up, like really, really immaculate. Um, all of the high standards that we came to to appreciate last year um, will will also be here this year. Um, we've we've changed venues purely because one, I want a wow factor again. So all of you people that came last year, and you're obviously all going to come again. Um, I wanted you all to turn up to a new venue and go, wow, um, which you wouldn't have done if we'd gone back to the same place. Um, the other reason why we've moved um, is this place is bigger. So they've got three buildings. We're going to use two of them. Um, we might use the third if we sell more tickets than than I've planned to sell. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're looking to sell 150 tickets. But the hotel can actually take 205. Um, it's all been planned around selling 150, and we won't use the third um, the third um, building, um, unless we shoot past that 150. But basically, um, so the, the two the two buildings there's there's a there's the accommodation building, and that's absolutely magnificent. Um, and then there's the actual conference building, and the conference building um, we've got every single room in there. We can we can pretty much do exactly what we want wherever we want. Um, there's loads, we can do like branding on the floor. We've got loads of space for like an expo type area for, for sponsors that need tables for things. Are you uh, still going to have two, uh, last year there was like two, so two, two tracks. tracks. Yes. So we've got two tracks again this year. Um, anyone that might have gone onto the website might, might realize that there's only one room big enough for, for the track, but I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep the answer to that a secret. Uh, until until people turn up, but yeah, there will be two tracks again. So there'll be a VoIP track, and then there'll be a WebRTC track. Um, well, other RTC track. So um, so last year it turned into a WebRTC track with like one or two other RTC type things. This year, I'd absolutely love to see more 
other RTC, um, more more web, more web audio, um, more web assembly type stuff that you can all kind of integrate into this great experience. Um, Sounds but, like you're talking about signal wire to me. Right. <laughs> um but but yeah we'll, we'll see i mean so the it, it's all completely and utterly community driven so if if the community submit talks like that then yes i'm the one that moderates them and figures out what the content is that i want in the conference but it's not like i go around saying to person x and person y you should really put a talk into this into this conference um, and this is the topic you should submit. Um, it doesn't work like that. Um, it, it's it's all community driven. So yeah, if Evan wants to come and talk about Signal Wire or some of the cool stuff that they're doing with like speech recognition and and all of that jazz, um, I think he did some of that last year actually. But um, whatever whatever people want to submit, they can submit. So whatever is kind of hot within that within the community at the moment is is what will get put into the into the conference dan how did it happen that there were three women there one from facebook one from slack and one from somebody remind me uh, Loipa, Mira. well yeah as well as allison maybe there were four well there's allison but anyway my point is um slack and facebook how did that happen you must have gone out to try to get people like that no or did that, that come from you or did it come how did that, that happen that that was me approaching certain companies including slack including facebook and and saying um hey i'm putting on this conference do you want to do you want to put something into it um slack was meant to be it wasn't just meant to be lindsay uh lindsay was the one that ended up coming but it was meant to be lindsay and another guy uh, at the last minute plans changed so it wasn't it wasn't as though i had reached out to to people i knew at slack and went Hey, um, hey, Lindsay, do you want to come and speak and be be the token girl at the conference? Um, Actually, she was the winner of the contest with whatever that game is, right? The, the giant Jenga game. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, yeah, it, it, it's it's just a case of reaching out to companies and, and saying we're we're holding this event. Um, I think you'd have some great content. Do you want to submit something? And it's up to them what they submit. And and it doesn't matter to me whether or not they are Slack or whether or not they're Facebook or whether or not they're Google. The the content speaks for itself. And if it's not good content, it doesn't get put in. Okay. Well go to comcon.xyz. Actually, I last time I looked at it, it wasn't working. So go yeah, to go, go to 2019.comcon.xyz. Right. Um, and uh you'll yeah. find the uh the place to turn to uh propose proposals right so yeah at the top there's a cfp button um which will take you down to to the a paper call link we use we use a system called paper call um and then um yeah you can you can submit the talk at paper call um there's also a purchase link for early bird tickets where it's 200 pounds off um we're doing other half tickets again this year so um if you want to bring your other half um, you can you can bring your other half. The Latimer Estate is about thirty minute tube ride from Central London. Um, you can get a tube from the pretty much five minutes away from the from the tube station um, to into Central London, and it will take you about thirty minutes. Yeah, that's actually very significant because there was there was not at all that possibility at the other place. It was a great yeah. place, but there was no way to get anywhere. No, no, it was it was a 15, 20 minute ride to the train station. And then from that train station, it was then going into London and it still wasn't central London. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah, absolutely. The other half ticket um, pretty much just covers um, your your board and everything. There is no profit made or anything like that because you're not in any of the conference sessions. It's it's purely just designed to so that you can join in in evening activities and and have breakfast have lunch have have a bed there you go all right dan thank you for that and um, we'll be in touch you you can keep coming by as you wish we're gonna get back to evan who we woke up at seven o'clock in the morning
he's got all his. Uh, <laughs> I think anyone who anyone who has children knows this is not an uncommon occurrence. I know Dan's aware of this. I'd like to I'd like to put another another um, you know pump for the Dan's conference as well. Uh, Comcom was it was just a fantastic time last year. The people were great. The conversations were fantastic. The location was amazing. So anyone listening who is even on the fence should a hundred percent consider coming. I mean, so I, I'll leave you with this. I, I was talking to a sponsor earlier, and, and they a potential sponsor, and, and they were asking me about the content of the conference and what what kind of themes would we be having and, and all of that. And, and my reply to them was, well, the themes and, and the content aren't really decided yet because the CFP hasn't ended. Um, but to me, the themes and the content aren't the most important thing. The most important thing is the relationships people build outside of the conference talks. Um, it's everyone sitting on the patio at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night after herding some ducks, having a drink and and forming a connection. Um, I'm sure there's many people that feel like they could send Evan an email now, whereas they didn't before. Um, and to me, that's the purpose of the conference. Um, you can pretty much run a good conference with good content um, any day of the week because we've got amazing talent within this industry. What we're what we're missing um, is is a chance to build these relationships, um, and ComCon is is completely and utterly aimed towards building building those. Agreed. Thank you very much, and I will leave you to uh, to listen to Evan a bit more. In okay. He, he looks like he's nice and warm. I won't show you outside my window right now. <laughs> Doggy and cold. It's beautiful here. See you later. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Let me get uh, Michael Graves to comment on the weather there because he's in shorts. So what's the temperature there, Michael, in Houston? Uh, let's see. Hang on. Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Um, the, temp the temperature here, that's a good question. It's not bad. It's probably in the high 50s or low 60s. Uh, it's a little... Just like an app, my uh, Netatmo app, fifty nine it is. Oh, that's uh, outside time of year. And it actually, well, hang on, it looks like this to look at our security cameras. It's a bit misty and it's not rainy, but it's a bit misty today. Not too bad. Let's uh, call on Jay Carpenter out in Phoenix, Arizona. What's the temperature, Jay? Do you know? It's thirty nine degrees right now, and there's actually snow on the mountains around Phoenix. It's thirty nine Fahrenheit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think it's yeah. much warmer than that here. Much yeah, warmer. it was actually snowing yesterday. Wow. I understand they had snow in Las Vegas as well. So that's crazy. Well, it, it is somebody crazy. Somebody on whether it was going to melt in twenty minutes or not, too. <laughs> Let's get back to Evan. Evan, um, I need you to help us out with uh, things that we totally never thought of. Uh, oh, somebody's calling us. <laughs> hey, is that signal wire? Let me look. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Probably Google Voice. Anyway, um, what have we not talked about here? Uh, I'm not familiar at all with LAML. What, what are the possible languages? Sure. So we have SDKs in, gosh, a bunch of languages for LAML. Um, you know, C Sharp. C++, I think, uh, Ruby, Python, um, nothing in Go yet. We've had a number of requests for uh, Go language libraries, which we are looking at. We just don't currently have any in-house Go talent. So, you know, we're trying to focus on our core competencies at the moment. So you're going to see SDKs coming out in Relay, uh, which is the new API set, in languages of which we use most heavily internally. Um, but yeah, if you anyone, PHP also as well, um, a lot of PHP users. So. You know, you go there to SignalWire right now, you can get all of those libraries. Um, and again, they're fully compatible with uh, Twilio and the Twimmel markup language. So people who have existing applications can really just kind of change one or two lines and move them over. Uh, and we've been demoing that with a lot of people. And that's actually, that's been a really, um, it, was a, it was an idea that we kicked around, you know, when the company first got started is, do we want to spend the time and the energy doing this compatibility layer? Um, but it really ended up fitting with our mission really well of trying to make this a seamless experience for everybody and an easy transition and letting people realize they don't have to like give up their current. One of the biggest blocks that, you know, as we all know, like doing anything new is trying to give up or having to recode or do anything else uh, all over again from scratch. And so we're like, cool, just bring your existing thing over, use it. And then as we release more advanced things, you can kind of just hook them right in. Um, one fun thing will be when Relay comes out that, uh, 
at some point soon, you'll be able to basically take a label call that's going off, which is just an XML script that's running. You got to use all this stuff, and basically just like grab it via relay and be like, nope, I'm going to turn this into a relay call and just pull it over like into the new world. So basically, you can have your existing application and be like, oh, now I realize I want some of this. And instead of having to get the callbacks um, where all that web stuff is streamed back to your server, you'll be able to hook up your Relay client and just see all the events that are happening, answered, hung up, ringing, uh, as well as you know, real-time billing information, which is something that I guess I didn't realize wasn't really a thing. Because I, you know, before we started digging into this a few years ago, I kind of was wondering how everyone did billing. As we all know, billing is like a big problem for most companies, right? You have to you build your own billing system, you're gonna pay for something, like every, you know, or even just keeping track, even just auditing what's going on. Uh, and the current way you have to do it is sort of manual using existing, you know, players. Um, you have to keep track of like the length of your own phone calls. You have to keep track of like, you know, what's going on, what state they are. If you leave them up and running, they'll kind of just keep going forever. You can kind of set timeouts, but it's a bit weird. It, as a guy who's been working in the industry now for, you know, a long time, I found it super confusing. And I can only imagine someone jumping up for the first time would be just, you know, crushingly confused as to how to do pretty much anything. And the pricing alone is kind of brutal, right? You go to the pricing pages for some of these guys and it's like, you know, every minute costs this amount plus the DID costs this amount plus the SIP endpoint costs this amount. It's, oh, you want, you know, that secure TLS or SRTP, that's going to be an additional upcharge. I put up people in a conference, it's like per user, per minute. It's, it's like impossible to calculate. So uh, we're going to do away with all of that as much as we can as well uh, and really try to make it simple. Interesting that you mentioned that, Evan, because uh, I noticed, and I didn't look into this extensively, but what I, when you have a number, uh, a, 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 and, um, a DID, you have, there's four icons there, I think, and of mm -hmm. course, voice, but it can also receive text and it can also receive faxes and maybe some other, I don't know what else there would be, but the point is uh, that stuff's all there. As far as I remember, you don't, when I got the number, I didn't have to ask for SMS. That's right. So that's not the case in anything else I've messed with. Usually you ask for it, there may or may not be a setup charge, but there's going to be a monthly of some kind. Yeah. Which, by the way, I never understood because it's really not that hard. To, that's not a complicated thing to add as far as I know. Maybe gateways do charge, so maybe that is a problem. But anyway, something to note as far as what SignalWire is doing is that, and also fax, which you know, I have zero use for personally, <laughs> but a lot of people still live in the 19th century Absolutely. So, you know, it's there apparently, right? Yeah, it is. It's, it was a major request. I mean, I too, I've wanted tracks to die for God, decades and uh, it won't go away. People still use it. You know, we have lots of lots and lots of people who have said, hey, please, please give us facts. Are there um, other things that you can do with? So if I send a fax, I've got my label or whatever else I'm doing with, you know, web hooks or calls, whatever callbacks, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. what, can, what can you do with the facts, though, except relay it or send it somewhere? Are there things you can do that are cute? I think, you know, I'm sure you could. I've never thought about doing anything cute with facts besides just talking trash about it. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's all uh, <laughs> I know, right? But I think it's like most people use it because they have to for some sort of weird, like, like you know, not even regulatory, but just because of, what, like, somewhere like... Uh, like the city of LA, I think requires faxes for you know permits for things and stuff like stuff like that. Things where you're like, vote, oh well, you can vote by fax. In the it, it is, yeah. it's, a, it's a it's legally considered facsimile is written into a lot of law and right. rules, and and right. consequently, consequently, you have doctors, the medical community, and lawyers using faxes as if they were hard copy. Well, they are hard copy, but as if they're not malleable hard copy, which they yeah. are supremely malleable. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy pants. I don't think they realized how terrible that is. But oh, you can let me take, take your fax into Photoshop and turn it into something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, could, you could generate an entirely fake fax. Obviously, it's easier even than Photoshopping. So yep. it's crazy. Yeah. But no, that, no. I realize that that is what it is. And so if you need fax, it's there. Yep, it's there for you, and you can use it, and we priced it super competitively, so people can just kind of get in there, and hopefully you'll realize, you know, that you don't want it for that much longer. <laughs> but so we'll I, I, I have a question, and it's not about facts, because I, I don't think facts is going to go away. Yeah. But it is, it is going to diminish. Um, right. But I have, I have a question about uh, a video. How does video fit into your plans, if sure. it does at all? I mean, that's, oh, yeah. maybe it doesn't, because... Um, the video minutes used still swamped by the voice minutes used, but 
How's that fit in? Great question. Um, if it's in very heavily. Uh, so, you know, what we're coming, part of Relay, for one of the first things we're going to be releasing are WebRTC APIs, uh, which are primarily focused on, you know, video calling and audio calling as well, but from inside the browser and from anywhere a WebRTC endpoint kind of exists. Um, our video stuff is going to be, is basically, you know, going to be like a first class citizen in respect to the fact that inside the FreeSwitch project, right, uh, we have rebuilt on our technology, like our own WebRTC stack, right? So we track WebRTC standards internally. We have our own WebRTC stack that we can control fully. Um, we are doing some pretty interesting things with that. And what it does allow us to do as well is sort of as WebRTC changes inside the browser for Chrome and Firefox and Safari, we can kind of track those changes independently and keep it up to date so it continues to work even across like major browser shifts where it might break spec, which happens a lot more often than you'd expect, or maybe not. Uh, as you'd expect, but it does break quite often. So we track that, fix it, get it working, keep it running. Um, we do a lot of regression testing in that regard. Um, and our APIs will be there for all the video. Because what we want to do, and I think we dog food this every day, we actually work, the, all of SignalWire, and I haven't mentioned this before, all of SignalWire is a remote company. We don't have a headquarters necessarily anywhere. Uh, all workers are remote. Everyone, I think the most people we have in one city is two, or maybe three. Um, and so we live in a video conference all day long, much like this, right? But we run it on our own WebRTC. Uh, we call it Cantina. Um, and it is a online video chat. We just live inside of it. And as a remote worker, you know, maybe the first week or so of being on video all the time is a little bit awkward. But beyond that, it actually really does an amazing job of bringing people together. It makes the, you know, you kind of, everyone has basically their own little virtual office. Um, people expect you to be there during work hours. You kind of come knock. People, you know, a lot of the sales guys work together in the same room a lot. Um, but they can jump over into engineering and say hi. We can pop over to them and answer questions. Uh, and so part of it really for like a uh, powerful, amazing aspect that uh, we use every single day. And so we do see that while voice and SMS swamps at the moment all kinds of video traffic, we see a powerful migration to video, both for this sort of co-working aspect, but also in the sense of like online games. I don't know if anyone here plays HQ Trivia or knows that game at all. Um, it's like an online trivia game where every day at its preset time from New York, they have a guy who basically does some trivia questions. But it's a live broadcast at like you know 9 a.m., noon, 2 p.m., things like that, with a real-time interactive element. Uh, and they usually have millions of people online at once watching this real-time stream, playing that game. So we see building in video communication into applications like that as well as a real challenge, right? Those guys. Uh, have a lot of lag issues and have more problems with kind of the way their infrastructure was originally built. Uh, but if they were to build that in SignalWire originally, where it was like you know, quality video, a, a broadcast quality video from a single spot, and they wanted that to scale up to 100 million video endpoints at one time, and they build that into their iOS app, and they use us to power the back end, then it would just kind of seamlessly all work. And so personally, I think that video uh, and the kind of related ecosystem is going to continue to accelerate. Uh, but does have a different set of challenges, right? With a lot more CPU intense on the uh, phone to decode. Uh, it's bandwidth more intense. Um, so there's a whole different set of challenges there that don't apply to voice or or texting, really. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Evan, I have a question. Any plans to incorporate payments into the mix? Sort of like um, as an API request, sort of? Well, you know, it, any any way t where you could basically just click a button or, you know, whatever and send a payment to whoever you're talking to or receive a payment, so forth. Sure. Um, I believe there's a movement in uh, WhatsApp and others to incorporate payments into their, their mix, so. Yeah, I would say that we have looked at the payment uh, architecture here, and I think that Right here, one, one moment while this truck goes by. There we go. The, um, yes, I would say that down the line, that's something that we're definitely taking a look at. We've seen how other companies are integrating payments into their... Sorry, did got truck coming by. Seeing how companies have been integrating payments into their API sets. We've seen what we've liked and what we haven't liked and what will fit with our general direction. Probably at first up will be accepting payments one way or another. Um, and making sure that's you know PCI and GDPR compliant and things like that. Uh, 
And then P2P style payments is something that we're also sketching out, figuring out how that might fit in. Yeah, you might be familiar with something called status in the uh, Ethereum cryptocurrency space. Right. And the uh, payments are kind of a, seem to be a, a key part of their mix as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, we have a number of people who are uh, both familiar with and active in the cryptocurrency spaces. We've looked a lot, we've looked very heavily into, um, you know, blockchain-based currency payment mechanisms um, or even, you know, just DAG-related things like that. So we're dabbling pretty heavily into all that different sort of sphere to see, like, what makes sense and just kind of keeping an eye on the space effectively at this moment while we continue to build up all these other APIs, figuring out what makes sense for us in the long term. Cool, thanks. Uh, I already, I had one further issue I wanted to resolve and I can't remember what it is. So I did not write it down. What else do we I, I have? A, I have a question, another right. question. Evan, uh, any plans to have any kind of conference or get together for the Signal Wire community? I, I guess Flucon. Flucon, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so Glucon's the main one, right? Glucon would be the one that I would say everyone should come to. You want to talk to SignalWire? Please come to Glucon. Um, you know, we, we are going to be going around to other conferences, so you will see us hopefully sort of around the world, different places. Um, we want to continue to be very active, right? Sort of building on that legacy of uh, open source. We want to be part of the community, and uh, we want to get out there and sort of and, and let people know that we're here to sort of help change the game a little bit. But specifically, yeah, anyone who wants to come to KluCon, I can't suggest that highly enough. Chicago, um, beginning of August, um, come on down. You'll have all of us there pretty much. You know, um, I'll be there. Tony will be there. Um, everyone involved with the project, uh, both SignalWire and FreeSwitch, pretty much comes to that conference. So, uh, yeah, please. Okay, what else is up? I'm watching about 16 different chat windows, and uh, none of them have... <laughs> None of them have any actual comments that are on topic here. Well, you know, I wanted to bring up, it's fun. You're interested in interesting use cases for facts, but there was, you know, what I really, what I am excited about seeing with SignalWire is people doing just like crazy stuff. One of the things we want to do is build the API set in a way where it's simple enough to use, but powerful enough that you can kind of do little, anything you want, like just crazy, crazy cool things. You should have the power, hopefully when we are done, if we are ever done, You'll have the power of like a fully elastic communications platform, like at your fingertips. Do everything from video to audio to like real time chatting and payments, whatever else you'd want to do, all wrapped up into one. And I'm really curious to see what people can do. I mean, um, the artist in me is like, I'd love to see someone like do an art installation powered by SignalWire that allows you to do, you know, some sort of interesting video thing from around the world. Or I've joked with other friends of having like, you know, tens of thousands of people in the same video conference. And, you know, whether we can support that up front or not, but that kind of idea. I know one of our, um, one of our sales guys over Christmas even, like and this is kind of a great example too of like who should be able to do it. One of our sales guys over Christmas actually did like an SMS chat bot for his daughter where she could text Santa and have Santa like write back, right? And I think that used Google's dialogue flow or integration with them to do some like real time understanding on that. So like that kind of just cool stuff um, makes me really excited and really happy. And I that's what I wanna see. I wanna see people kind of ignoring the underlying communications layer and really just building cool stuff and getting it out there um, and being inventive with it. So I don't know if, you know, anything that we can do to help foster that and, and think of new cool use cases Something I always like to hear about as well. If anyone has any ideas, always just ping me and I can let you know what's going I want to, on. I want to see. I want to see a call center, and I don't know who's going to do it, but I, uh, or, or in what business it makes sense. But I want to see a call center for an online retailer, wherein when I have a problem, they drop to a WebRTC video chat with me. Yeah. Uh, and and because. Well, I won't go into today's Go Texan Day, by the way, which means that next week the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo opens, and mm -hmm. and there's a great big parade of of uh, horseback riders and stuff coming in from all around the state. And but I bought some Western boots mail order, and this is like the perfect case where I needed somebody. This is one of those things where you don't normally buy these things online. I needed right. somebody to pick it up and show it to me, right? Right. And, and this is where, had we been able to do a little video chat thing with somebody in a call center who had access to some sample inventory, it would have been like a virtual retail store. It would have been perfect. 
Exactly. And I think like that is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Being able to, we're building in from the ground up that idea of that context sensitivity too, right? So let's say you're like texting with them, be like, I need these boots, right? You take that conversation, that text, take that right into a phone call, take that right into WebRTC. And the idea that the context of your communications follows you the whole way through. So, you know, they not only does the person on the far side see what you did before, but also like it can inform the next action and that kind of thing. So we are very heavily invested in that idea as well. Is that communication is very rarely siloed and, and you know, one dimensional in that regard. And it's been considered that way so far because of the different mediums. But we're now to the point where the mediums are all just IP anyway. Then um, you can have IoT tied into this too, little sensors. You know, maybe a sensor is out there, feeds back to the platform, like creates a phone call or an SMS. So you can kind of kind of roll from there. So uh, yeah, you're going to see all of that stuff kind of coming down the pike. Hopefully it's ASAP. Bring up an interesting point, uh, Evan, with regard to IoT, whereas, for example, um, you know, we have one of these vacuum cleaners that has an app and it's on the Wi-Fi, which I'm not that thrilled with, but it's yeah. the only way it, it runs now. Yeah, and, right. but, so it runs, so it um, it will send me the app sends via notifications, but in a way it might be it might be another idea to use a signal mm -hmm. wire. If you can talk to signal wire through an API and do SMS, and that way you're not relying, I, we, I guess you'd re, be relying on Wi Fi for the device uh, and the code. But what I'm saying, you wouldn't, it, you wouldn't need an app necessarily. Right. In other words, and well, for now, if it's one way and you mm -hmm. just need to send SMSs, the thing could have in, it could have code installed in the firmware and say, Okay, I'm done. So here's the SMS. I, I, I'm, of course, I've been doing right. the hardest part, which is configuring it to know your phone <laughs> number and so on. <laughs> but the point is, that's some of the more exciting stuff that you could do. Would be you've got the tool. So hey, yeah, you've got a thing that sends an SMS. You've got a thing that makes phone calls. The thing could also call you up and go, "I'm done," <laughs> or something. Exactly. Like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, we think we see smart devices like that. You know, if SignalWire were kind of just sort of baked in there a little bit, we've been talking to people um, in that industry, right? Like, you're not that far off, Randy. There's a big thing right now, uh, Korea, where they're doing um, video ovens. So ovens are displaying video, right? So you can watch your things bake inside of that. Well, they're like, well, apparently there's an entire subculture of watching things bake in, like in real time. And I was like, okay, cool. And we actually wanted to talk about can we stream real time baking from ovens, like you know, to places online? And we're like, sure. You know, SignalWire is the kind of exact place you could do that, um, helping facilitate that kind of thing. Or if the oven breaks, it can actually the oven itself can detect that it broke and call its own call center. And alert you and be like, hey, I have someone waiting to like talk to you whenever you're ready about the fact that like my element is busted. So that is something we've actually had inquiries about and are sort of actively talking to to folks about. That, that's funny. No, you got, the, the, the issue there. That's that's so funny because you're going to need like this high temperature capable camera element. Yeah. And, and if you're gonna and if you're gonna put one in there, you might as well put like five, one on right. either side and one on the top, and, right. and then offer them the opportunity to sort of spin it around. <laughs> Matrix style of food baking, you sort of, you know, 3D real yeah. time it. And, yeah, and you not? need to talk to Stacy Higginbotham about this in Austin because she's like IoT and she's into that. Uh, she's got that $2,000 IoT driven oven that you just, you put a piece of something in there and it identifies what it is and sets up to cook it automatically. That's crazy pants. I love it. Yeah, I would love to talk to her. Actually, we just ordered an oven. We don't have it yet. And it's I don't consider it IoT, but maybe it is. Um, it is connected through Wi-Fi. And it does, uh, uh, bouncing back on what you just said, Evan, a, a couple of minutes ago, they say in the documentation that if there's a problem with the oven, uh, it can contact tech service. Or maybe you contact right. them, But it's kind of through the oven. I don't know. I don't know since I don't have it yet. Right. There is well, some wacky so thing. And as these things kind of build up on top of each other, right? It's like, oh, okay, we'll contact you. Maybe we switch it to from an SMS, like a push notification, right? Something on like so then suddenly you start to bypass the entire traditional telecom network. Maybe these things start to talking to each other. So suddenly it's all IP based, right? This kind of layers up to the point where maybe you don't even need a traditional telecom network anymore. Um, maybe someone comes out with some sort of wireless SIM that we can do that just is a data only network. Finally, please, if someone would just do that across the world. Um, Isn't that the whole low I, bandwidth IoT thing? Yeah, that's the goal, right? And having worked, you know, I guess I forgot to mention that before um, SignalWire, I was working uh, for a, an MVNO here in the U.S. Um, so I got a lot of exposure to wireless, at least in the with regards to how the U.S. does it. And uh, yeah, I mean, like the low bandwidth 
that they really want to pump that, particularly at, like in their legacy like 2G network stuff where they sunset all of that. Um, but even as the, the LTE and now the 5G stuff gets deployed, they really want more devices on board. Um, but they're really hesitant, right? They're hesitant to lose any revenue anywhere. The wireless companies are extremely risk averse. And so they really are trying to look for any way to make money off of what they've got. Um, and we'll see how, how depressed those prices get. I'm curious to know like how competition forces them down, particularly with the T-Mobile Sprint merger here in the US. It's a bit better in Europe, I think, but I, didn't look in, I haven't looked into it recently. There's another level of things that can be done with all the telecommunication tools that you and other people are offering, and that is, uh, whereas a small company does a really great thing, I've dealt with people through Amazon, for example, you know, shoelaces, eight euros delivered. So it's not, yeah. not a big deal. But um, those people, this is a different company and it's a diff totally different thing. But you get a, I have a handwritten note saying, here's your thing. I hope you enjoy it. Signed by a person. And this has actually been handwritten. Well, if you take that, if you want to scale that up to hundreds of thousands, obviously, they're not going to be handwritten anymore. Uh, but they could be, there could be a quick SMS thanking you for your order and saying, if you have any problem with it, you know, text me. And then right. that whole app, that whole... Um, uh, application behind that that's going to receive the text at such and such a number and will be able to possibly robotically if it's an obvious question i mean anyone who's done anything with this stuff can see that you could detect common problems and just go boom and probably do a better job than the boilerplate guy you're going to talk to in some country that has an accent you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh it's half-assed support and the robotic support might even be as good on the first level until it saw that it couldn't handle it then it rings somebody else and so on so there's a lot of great a lot of great possibilities out here and believe it or not we kind of filled up this hour right hey look at that well done everyone <laughs> yeah so we're gonna see what's your next uh meetup would be would it be um if you guys are going to uh, ipcom or what's before that comedy world right yeah, that's a good question. I think Camellia World will probably be the next one. Um, May in Berlin. I'd have, yeah, I'd have to double check uh, the, everyone else's calendars, but we'll be around. Yeah, let us know. You know, you're going to see us at most of the major conferences. Um, might not expect us at, hopefully. Uh, yeah, we'll be here, and we're always online as well. So if anyone ever, if anyone ever wants to chat, we're always hanging out in that that uh, video chat of ours, um, and you're welcome to come join us and say hi. And and the URL of that, with people. and the URL of that is. That would be um, good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll go find. I'll go find. I'll find the public one for that and put it in our oh. Slack. Go to go to signalwire.community. That's the best place to find us. Is in our Slack channel there uh, as well. We're always we're always hanging out in there and monitoring that one. Um, and yeah, we'd love to see absolutely everybody and anybody anytime. And there's plenty of help available on their Slack channel. All of that you can go to signalwire.com, figure it out, open an account, mess with it. Break it, move things, move fast, break things, et cetera, et cetera. And Please. they'll be on the other end to help you out. Let me just call on, uh, and thanks so very much, Evan, for getting up at an ungodly hour, preparing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have kids and you are. Never a problem. Anyway, we'll be looking forward to seeing you in May. I've got to call on Jay Carpenter because he took the trouble of being with us. And I know he's been doing things and is going to tell us at least a couple of URLs of his stuff and what they've been up to the last couple of minutes here, Jay. Well, so I am heading off to Arizona State University, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law in a couple hours for the Global Legal Hackathon, which will include decentralized constructs as well as blockchain in the legal realm. And um, <clears throat> so I don't have the URL for that, but it is a global event, sort of like Tad Hack, but um, combining. Um, Things like I, I'm going to be focusing on IPFS. Um, I came across a really cool uh, blog post from a company called Coral Health, where they're uploading encrypted files into IPFS, and it adds a whole new layer of security that I'm really excited about uh, experimenting with. And uh, so that's kind of what I'm up to. I'm also continuing to build out the Desert Blockchain Camps which are decentralized sort of nomadic uh, collaborative workspaces. And that's coming together really well. So and we can find that at your URL. Yeah. Uh, Desertblockchain.com basically All is right. your starting point. Yep. Okay. Well, we're going to launch into the great unknown of next week because this has been a VUC 740, 740 of these things. 
Um, we'll be starting our 13th year in March if I live that long. And March isn't that far away. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to you, Evan, and everybody at Signal Wire. Our congratulations. We will well, thank talk you guys. To you. Congratulations on 740. <laughs> yeah, really. I hope I live to 741 next week. <laughs> Take care, everybody. We're going to be out. Thank you.